Welcome uh, to the University Interdisciplinary Club for the 2nd of March. Thanks so much for making time today to spend an hour with us. We appreciate it. Uh, this is a series of presentations, the second one. This is the second one in the series. There will be four additional presentations every two weeks at this time. In the, in this, all but one of them will be in this room. The next one will be on the 16th of March. Uh, Professor Nita Abdullah from the Department of Art, Art History and Design will be with us to give a talk entitled The Framework for Capturing Interdisciplinary Dialogue. So that's on the 16th of March. Today we're very pleased to have with us Professor Kyle White. Uh, Kyle is the Tenric Chair in Humanities. He is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and also an Associate Professor of Community Sustainability. He does important research on a wide variety of areas. These include moral and political issues concerning climate policy and indigenous peoples, the ethics of cooperative relationships between indigenous peoples and science organizations, and problems of indigenous justice in public and academic discussions of food sovereignty, environmental justice, and the Anthropocene. He is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And today he's with us to give a talk entitled Indigenous Approaches to the Ethics of Knowledge Exchange. Professor White. <laughs> Miigwech, thank you. I appreciate the introduction and good to see everybody here. So in this presentation, I want to cover some of the key points on the work that I've done on science collaboration with indigenous people. And actually, in the work I've done through workshops and trainings, um, I've worked with, at this point, probably six, 700 climate scientists, especially, on what are the best ways to work with indigenous people. And so the reason you know, why I got into this um, is that you know, indigenous people globally and the, you, know, you can see this at the highest levels. So this is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People, Victoria Tauli Corpus. Uh, you know, I've said that climate change for indigenous people is one of the major topics that uh, we are facing as communities, as nations. And so you've seen scientists also, climate scientists, began to realize that uh, in addition to groups of people who are at risk from certain climate change impacts, um, indigenous people also know quite a bit about climate change that scientists don't always have access to. So oftentimes indigenous people live in areas for a long, long time, and scientists have never studied ecological trends in those areas. And so indigenous people seem to provide a wealth of potential information for climate scientists. But what we found is a lot of native people felt that that way of thinking about indigenous knowledge was fairly belittling because it reduced it to just information and that also oftentimes there were risks uh, and other issues that climate scientists weren't trained in uh, and that oftentimes would naively attempt to work with indigenous people to exchange knowledge uh, and uh, ac accidentally uh, 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 do things that would make those risks uh, more prevalent to those, uh, to those communities and to those peoples. So I wanted to kind of start over and talk about the question of indigenous knowledge about climate change in a different way that suggests some of the approaches that I've used to working with scientists to create better relationships with uh, indigenous people. And so, you know, oftentimes the information we see in scientific reports, so this is the U.S. Global Change Research Program National Climate Assessment, which I've been uh, part of and I'm part of the current one, um, this is the previous one, the third climate assessment for the U.S., and you can see that mostly indigenous people uh, are talked about as groups that are mostly at risk to current climate change issues or future climate change issues. And so it talks about things like changes in plant and animal movements, which uh, make it harder to get nutritious food. It talks about relocation due to sea level rise. Um, I know it's a little bit small, but you don't have to read it. I'm just putting it up there. so you know that I'm talking about something. Uh, <laughs> and so right in the current report, you know, again, talking about certain risks to indigenous economies and health from climate change. But, you know, what I've always thought, uh, and, and there's been a lot of, you know, sensationalist journalism and things like that, you know, what I've always thought, thinking about my perspective as a Potawatomi person, as a Anishinaabe person, it always struck me as funny that when climate scientists would approach uh, indigenous people about knowledge exchange, 
it was actually always assumed um, that for us, climate change was just as new of a topic as it was for many non-indigenous people. And so going into our traditions, we realized that in North America, uh, indigenous heritage and history, we've been talking about climate change for centuries, uh, whether it's in Mayan, Aztec calendars and almanacs, Lakota winter counts, uh, and numerous other traditions that the idea of climate change and that human societies have to design institutions to live with the climate is one of the oldest ideas. So for my group, Anishinaabe people, it's in our origin story that we are a migratory group and that part of how that story is told is that we migrated from the East Coast all the way to the Great Lakes over the course of many, many centuries. And the lessons that we learn across the migration are those concerned with what it means to have to learn and adapt to the dynamics of new ecosystems and to take lessons from what you learned in previous places of inhabitation, transferring them to the new places that you go, even though they're very different. And so it's actually an origin story of adapting to environmental change, but also in a sense to climate change as well. And so by the time we got to the Great Lakes region, we actually developed a governance system where the actual political philosophy was a highly fluid system of institutional design where the government would change shape, size, form at least 13 times during the year across the lunar cycle, but also had multiple clans, lodges, and other social groupings that at some points in the year would be considered the prime institutions for political authority, but at other points of the year would not. And so we didn't actually have the same government all year round. We had multiple governance that functioned in a highly fluid, highly transformative way. And so the idea that we had to be fluid in order to adapt to seasonal change, but also interannual climate change, was baked into our very governance system, to our very political philosophy. Uh, and so you see a lot of Anishinaabe people talking about their political philosophies in terms of systems of how to adapt and adjust to ecological change. And in a lot of my uh, earlier work, which I won't share too much with here, when me and my colleagues, uh, including folks like Nick Rio, looked very closely at certain aspects of contemporary Anishinaabe seasonal governance, what we actually found is that people understood that the best way for a society to be as resilient and adaptive as possible was to have high quality moral relationships within that society. So high levels of trust, high levels of consent, high levels of reciprocity, high levels of diplomacy, which we can understand here is the idea that it's okay to have secrets when you work with different people. And so these were the qualities that actually overlapped with the ability to achieve certain ecological outcomes and certain adaptive outcomes. And so, well, that's not the only way and I don't have to say it's the best way to think about sustainability or resilience. It's a unique vector that Anishinaabe and other indigenous traditions bring to that discussion, right? Looking at sustainability, looking at adaptability, looking at resilience as actually a function of the degree of quality of the fabric of moral relations within a society. And so this is why you see that when native people construct contemporary calendars, almanacs, and other ways of understanding their seasonal lifestyle, that it's always about human relationships being heavily entwined through morality with the environment, with non-humans. So my friend Shannon McNeely, in her work with the Khoikon people in the Arctic, they constructed this seasonal wheel. And you can see it's completely infused with human and non-human interaction, with technology. This, USDA project with the Nez Perce tribe, right, articulated their seasonal political philosophy. And these are very different from like how EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, looks at climate change, right? Because what do you notice are some of the key, um, you know, differences is that, you know, if you compare the, the Koyakon to the, the EPA one, you hardly really see humans involved. You don't really see moral relationships. You don't really see change and transformation. And while I don't think that this is like bad, um, I do think it presents a different perspective so that my friend Megan Bang does really interesting scholarship on children's education, which sheds a lot of light on why there's still a continued failure to actually feel responsible for the environment. Because if as a child, your science material is more like this, and I don't know that this one was necessarily 
geared itself toward early childhood education, but if you had something like this as part of your science education, you wouldn't really get a sense that environmental relations are moral relationships. Um, you wouldn't really get a sense that you were heavily, you know, imbricated and entwined within the environment, um, whereas with the other ones you actually would. And this is an important point about knowledge exchange, because when we get into questions of what are the ethics of knowledge exchange, one of the first issues that comes up is how do you understand epistemic diversity? And so epistemic diversity is not really about, well, indigenous people might know something that scientists don't, <laughs> Right? It's rather that each knowledge system comes out of a totally different history and trajectory. And even though later on I'll talk a little bit about how knowledge systems can be braided together, can mix, can work together in different ways, a key thing to always actually remember is that our knowledge systems have very different focuses, they have very different vectors of analysis. Um, and so for a climate scientist or somebody who's educated on climate change, it might seem like it's a problem of the last century, right? Um, at least uh, the, the sort of uh, you know, idea that humans now really have to be responsive to climate change. But for indigenous science, um, it's actually considered not to be a new idea. Um, and even though I think many scientists and anthropologists would say, yeah, well, we've been studying climate across many centuries and so on, that's often not the way that it's discussed within the, the mainstream in countries like the United States. And then for indigenous people too, when we talk about knowledge, we like to talk about the things I was just showing you before, culture, morality. That's part of the epistemic discussion. And so it's not looked at as a bias, um, it's just looked at as the way things are. And I've always thought it's funny that in my engagement with fields like science and technology studies, where for a lot of years, right, the issue is just trying to show the different ways in which values are infused within scientific processes, uh, most indigenous traditions never had that hang up, that there was such a thing as a value-free ideal. Um, rather, that's just always how uh, native people have talked about science. And so in a lot of my recent work, I've tried to bring out what a lot of these intellectual traditions are and how they talk about knowledge, you know, with climate change, with indigenous environmental studies. Um, and so it's been sort of something that I've been very interested in doing. Now, another aspect of the ethics of knowledge exchange which is particularly important when thinking about collaborations with indigenous people, is that our knowledge systems, our, our heritage of our knowledge systems, has been greatly curtailed, destroyed, uh, violated by colonialism. Um, and so my colleague uh, Candace Callison, I think, puts it really well, right? When you think about climate change, you actually need to think about well, what does it mean for groups like indigenous people who even before the contemporary climate change ordeal had undergone you know, decades and centuries of violent environmental transformation due to different forms of colonialism and imperialism. So take my tribe for example. Um, you know, we were in the Great Lakes region. We exercised centuries of seasonal governance. Then this happened to us in the 19th century. We were literally forced to move from one climate region to the next and got literally had to cede all of this land, right, including pretty close to where campus is, uh, and go all the way down first to Kansas and then to what was at the time Indian Territory, which is where the U.S. wanted to put um, as many tribes as it could, right? So they stuck us kind of in the middle with a number of other tribes from the Great Lakes, but shoot, there were tribes from everywhere in that region. And so Oklahoma is a very different climate region than the Great Lakes. And so in that way, we were among the first climate change, you know, survivors and relocation uh, peoples because uh, we were forced by another society um, to change climate regions and to adapt to a very different climate system. And so when people talk about, oh, well, it's anthropogenic climate change, the human caused climate change, that's what's new today. In a way, that's not really true. And in some of my other presentations where I talk about my climate justice work in more detail, um, you know, I then, I oftentimes show the example that when I first moved back to the Great Lakes region uh, to take this job, it was really ironic to see a few EPA climate change profiles that actually showed that in 50 years or so, the climate in Michigan will be like the climate in Oklahoma. Um, and so from an indigenous perspective, that's kind of 
haunting because given the US industrial society's implications in causing that recent climate change, it is actually kind of like they're still trying to get us all into Oklahoma, right? Even the Anishinaabe people that uh, still live in the Great Lakes. And ironically, our ancestors actually thought that Oklahoma was a pretty good idea because they thought it was so ugly that nobody else would try to settle it, right? But then uh, they struck oil in Oklahoma. They figured out, the settler society figured out strategies for you know, overproducing in agriculture, which then created other types of climate change in the region, such as the Dust Bowl. And so actually, again, we found ourselves uh, completely dispossessed of our land base. And so this is our jurisdictional area, but you'll notice that the, the uh, orange and the purple areas, which are actually the areas that we exercise sovereignty over, are no longer the majority um, of that land, right? And the purple areas are just the ones, the areas of land we own in fee like anybody else and pay uh, taxes on. Uh, and so basically, uh, what I think a lot of climate scientists need to understand is for us, we've been through a long history of human forced environmental change and to a certain extent climate change too. And we're actually trying to rebuild our knowledge systems in environments that are very different from those that our ancestors would have experienced. Um, and so for me, a big part of my philosophical approach has been in this context of the rebuilding of our nation from scratch. Um, and so when I was, about the time I was born, this was actually our tribal headquarters and our current tribal chair, Rocky Barrett, you know, talks about um, how we just had a few hundred dollars in our, in our account. Um, we we're, weren't doing that well. Um, and so in a very short period of time, we'd gone from a tribe that was actually very successful within the fur trade um, to a tribe that was reduced uh, to having almost nothing. But we had to rebuild ourselves and had to appeal to Western institutions to do so. Um, and so now our tribe has a large scientific staff that primarily does science like you'd see it here at Michigan State. Um, but at the same time that we've harnessed uh, Western institutions, um, we're also going back to those principles and moral traditions from the Great Lakes region where we learned them um, to find guidance um, in the best ways to grow our economy, to, uh, to grow our society, and to achieve uh, the kind of well-being that we can achieve. Um, and so our traditions remain very important. And so this is another <clears throat> kind of aspect that is oftentimes uh, not understood, is that most indigenous people, we use uh, Western science. Um, but we oftentimes use Western science in ways that are <clears throat> guided by some of those moral traditions. So often, when we talk about mainstream science, we talk about issues of accountability. But in our tribe and many other tribes, the scientific staff, it's kind of a community norm that you have to work with elders, you have to work with youth, you have to have community meetings. You can't just do your scientific work in the dark. <clears throat> and that comes out of our tradition <clears throat> of ensuring that the sort of the scientific enterprise is one that's about producing benefits for the community, um, and not one that's about advancing people's sort of individual research careers. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a, a missing aspect oftentimes in collaborations with scientists, is that from a tribal perspective, we're also trying to engage in our own scientific practices, and we're trying to find ways to do so ethically. And so Potawatomi people now are spread all over the place. We're on the U.S. side, we're on the Canada side as far south as Oklahoma, but we're also in Ontario um, and uh, uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So because of these histories of colonialism, you know, it's important to actually understand how the work of indigenous organizations, the work of indigenous governments is actually trying to change the conversation about what it means to be effective in knowledge exchange. So for example, the work of the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is very important because they're trying to take this massive scale dispossession that's occurred and actually suggest that if we want to again rebuild our knowledge traditions, we have to have that large access to land that's been lost through a number of U.S. colonial policies. Uh, some of you probably follow uh, Winona LaDuke's work, right? And her work is bringing to light and bringing back the idea that indigenous knowledge is knowledge that connects both the spiritual aspects of life with keen observation 
of the environment. The Dakota Access Pipeline issue that occurred this year with the Standing Rock Tribe, they actually featured their knowledge as part of what drove that activism. And as many of you know, they don't like to call it activism. It's actually a form of ceremony. It's a form of cultural practice. And so the mini Wachoni knowledge system, right, the water is life knowledge system philosophy actually suggests an entire way in which humans relate morally to water and how that actually secures a healthy ecosystem. The Indigenous Environmental Network, active globally on a number of declarations and efforts to actually show that, yeah, Indigenous knowledge is not just about information, but it's about changing how we think of the ethical relations between scientists and people who know, or knowledge keepers, um, and those that they're responsible for. In politics, uh, the Treaty Rights at Risk initiative, uh, which is within the tribes that are in what's now called uh, Western Washington. Um, this focuses very heavily on the idea that the actual purpose of the treaty system was so that indigenous people in that area would be able to continue long-standing relationships with they ha that they had with certain plants and animals, and obvi an obvious one is, is salmon. But the point of this work, right, is to suggest that the treaty right is not just about maintaining certain levels of salmon, but ensuring that the tribes in the region continue to practice their own ways of knowing and relating to salmon and to working with Western science in a way that's equal. And so the whole idea of, of, of treaty rights is one that's infused with a certain conception of what indigenous knowledge means. More specifically in the realm of climate science, it goes back to the 1990s that indigenous people were very active in pushing US federal agencies to involve indigenous leadership and indigenous knowledge keepers in the climate science conversation. And we've seen a number of different events, many of which I've been part of. Um, this is a, the first steward symposium, which occurred twice in Washington, DC trying to bring together different indigenous people to talk about the implications of their knowledge system on climate change. And oftentimes people get up and do talks and speeches, but oftentimes people express their knowledge through performance. And this is another key thing that we see in a lot of discussions about uh, indigenous uh, climate change and indigenous knowledge is that knowledge is oftentimes not something that uh, you say hold and communicate verbally, right, but it's something that through performance and music and other forms of expression, that's actually the knowledge. As well as the idea that it's not even fair, at least for some tribal communities, to say that humans uh, possess knowledge. I mean, Anishinaabe people, for example, don't really believe that humans are, are what we might call in English knowers. It's everything else that's a knower, um, and the humans are sort of clamoring to figure out how to best respect these great knowers and how best to sort of you know, uh, try to learn as much as, as, as possible, um, but never claim the title of sort of you know, epistemic authority or, or, or knower. And so really indigenous people are changing the conversation about what it means to know about climate change. So Sheila Watt Cloutier's work completely rearranges things, right? It's about the right to be cold. It's not about avoiding warming in a certain sense, but the right to be cold. And she emphasizes um, in a lot of her work, right, that it's not that uh, Inuit people don't know how to adapt, their whole history is of having adaptive knowledge, but other groups need to take into consideration that the current climate change impacts are forcing a type of adaptation. When you combine it with the other harms of colonialism, it makes it excruciatingly bad for many indigenous communities. And so if you look at some of the legal documents, such as the Inuit petition, which she played a role in, uh, they, they talk about indigenous knowledge issues as part of the legal aspects of how to deal with harms related to climate change. In some of the work I've done with the National Congress of American Indians, where we actually called for reforms uh, in U.S. policy based on uh, 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 tribes' concerns about climate change, uh, you know, the knowledge component was, uh, was huge. Um, and so we had like different principles and, and so on that we had asked to be implemented at the level of uh, US government and it included a range of ideas and concepts related to knowledge. So not only do we have strong uh, requests for tribes to be involved at all levels of climate change related governance in the US, but also that when scientists work with tribes that they have to follow uh, norms of free prior and informed consent. 
in indigenous declarations like the Mystic Lake Declaration. If you read through it, you'll see it talks all about indigenous knowledge, and you can't really tell, right, when it's talking about spirituality, when it's talking about ecological knowledge, uh, you know, when it's talking about science, it's all understood as being related together and hard to uh, disentangle. Uh, indigenous peoples have actually been among the leaders in bringing attention to the ideas that gender is a key aspect of how we know or come to know climate change. Uh, and so if you look at the history of studies of gender and climate change, it's oftentimes indigenous people, many of whom don't have Western academic training, uh, and this is from the Tape Table organization, uh, which is a global indigenous uh, network, um, you know, that they were the first saying you can't study climate change impacts without studying gender. And so in my uh, collaborations with uh, scientists, that's one of the things I've often noticed is that scientists are oftentimes used to talking about climate change without talking about gender, uh, without talking about sexuality. Uh, whereas for a lot of native folks, that's just a very normal conversation to, to have. Um, and so in a report that I was part of that summarized a lot of the literature on indigenous climate change and gender, um, you know, we made sure that in that technical report um, that it had the right type of vocabulary, right? Stuff that indigenous people would be more comfortable with and it's reflected in indigenous literature. And this was a real hustle to have to get through because the Forest Service isn't used to these types of terms, but now they're sort of official vocabulary, um, which I think is, is good, but it's also kind of funny. Um, another thing you'll see is in indigenous people, uh, you know, are changing how we think about climate change vulnerability and health. So this was a recent uh, U.S. Global Change Research Program report that I was an uh, author on. And, you know, we were showing that you can't just talk about climate change as having, you know, economic uh, uh, harms associated with it, but climate change is about culture. It's about emotion. It's about psychological well-being. And so a lot of the indigenous uh, uh, literature that we looked at was very clear that you can't talk about climate change impacts without talking about changes and effects to people's culture. Going further back into the 2000s, the Arctic Climate Assessment was one of the first climate science documents that I had seen that actually talked very closely about the connections between climate change and the very fabric that holds society together. So some of the native people that were interviewed in this report actually said that as elders uh, who are knowledge keepers are no longer as uh, able to make relevant uh, judgments about the environment because it's changing so rapidly then that also disrupts the respect that younger people have for them. And so a harm associated with climate change is a kind of social disintegration. Um, and you know, this is something a lot of climate scientists at that time, um, you know, who I know now, that wasn't something that was on their radar. And so again, I think these issues of, of gender and these issues of kind of social fabric, these issues of culture, I mean, these are things that from an indigenous knowledge perspective are front and center for climate change, but oftentimes weren't for many climate scientists who um, you know, primarily look at climate change through certain types of models or certain types of historic trends. So if there's gonna be ethical collaboration, uh, we have to already be prepared to use the terms and frames and vectors and so on um, that pertain to each knowledge system. And notice from an indigenous perspective to subscribe to the types of aspects of a knowledge system that I'm talking about here, that doesn't mean that you're somebody who lives a subsistence lifestyle. You could be, right? You could be somebody who's engaged in intergenerational subsistence practices. So you and your family know a ton about a particular region of which I know many native people that this is the situation that they're in. But you can also be somebody who grew up outside of your uh, particular tribal homeland um, and primarily engaged in Western education, but through your family interactions, through your other educational experiences, right? You came to a different way of thinking and knowing about climate change. So it's a way of thinking about indigenous knowledge that doesn't force us to, um, you know, to suggest that it's only some people that might see climate change like this and people who live very particular types of lifestyles. In the realm of climate change planning, we see a ton of important work that indigenous people are doing. When I started working on climate change issues a bit over a decade ago, um, I don't think there were any tribes that had a climate change plan in the U.S. Now there's well over 50, and I think it's even higher than that, that have climate change plans. Uh, 
But if you look at a lot of tribal climate change plans you know, that are available uh, just to look at online, like this is for St. Regis Mohawk, they're totally different than like the standard uh, climate science ones. So the Aquasasti Mohawk, they don't organize it in the classic way of kind of you know, vulnerability assessment and uh, you know, options for adaptation. They organized a whole plan around what they call their Thanksgiving address, which is a very complex set of categories for different human and non-human relationships. One of the most famous ones is the three sisters, beans, corn, and swash, and the human responsibility to maintain those ecological habitats. So that's actually a category. And so instead of seeing something like, you know, vulnerability to, uh, you know, drought, you see the three sisters, and it starts off and says the history of that relationship, um, what it means to people in the tribe, how they think using that knowledge system, they are at risk to climate change. And then after that, it brings in the results of Western climate science. Um, and so in that sense, right, they're saying, well, why is it that we should structure what we do um, based on what Western science says? Rather, let's braid those traditions together um, and come up with something that is based on what their community feels about climate change. And what's important about doing climate change plans like this um, is that these are documents that somebody in that community who's interested in language or culture, interested in politics, interested in science, anybody can engage with it. Um, and you can learn a ton of things about it, right? You can learn about your own culture at the same time that you're learning about climate change issues. And the last thing I'll talk about before I touch on a few um, examples of educational work I do is I think indigenous people have also really taken the lead on redefining what standard ethics means, like liability-based ethics means for knowledge exchange. So I've been part of this group called the um, Climate and Traditional Knowledges Work Group, and it's about 10 other folks uh, who are part of it, who most of whom are indigenous, but people have spent a lot of time working on knowledge exchange and felt that there were some aspects of ethical knowledge exchange that scientists were, were missing. And so we started with kind of basic ethics guidelines and we're kind of like, well, how do we really you know, teach climate scientists um, you know, the significance of something like the principle of cause no harm or the principle of free prior and informed consent. And we found that there were a lot of differences that were worth discussing. So for example, oftentimes many scientists thought that consent um, referred to the idea that you figure out what you want to study, you develop the research uh, method and approach, and then once you're ready to do it, you go through a consent process uh, with the people that, uh, beyond the scientific team, who will be involved in the research, right? Um, but for indigenous people, actually, consent doesn't mean that. Consent means that they're involved at conception. And so before the actual project has been formulated, they expect the scientists to say, you know what, we want to study you know, sea level rise, or we want to study drought. Do you want to study that too? Yeah, okay, well let's figure out how to come up with an approach and a method that will work for all of us and that the actual results of the science will benefit everybody too. The scientists will have their publications, will you know, have the results of their project, but then the indigenous communities too will have information that's beneficial to their planning processes for climate change or it'll be beneficial for their educational processes. Another thing we realize is that most scientists in the US, but in other countries too, don't know about the history of colonialism. And so for some scientists who are say interested in what indigenous people knew about a local area in terms of environmental change, um, they were shocked when they started hearing from native people uh, that they were actually imposing risks on indigenous people. Because they were thinking, well, climate science doesn't pose risks. I mean, that's other areas like anthropology or you know, other parts of environmental science, right? And, and those fields have, you know, had a long history of trying to improve um, how they do what they do and have made a lot of strides. Climate scientists didn't think that they were imposing those risks. But if you know a little bit about the history of colonialism, you know that even for tribes and treaty right, with treaty rights, for example, they uh, uh, don't have treaty rights that are fully respected by the United States. And so if you have a treaty right that protects you to continue harvesting a certain plant or animal, you oftentimes have to do that under the cover of darkness, right? You do it illegally. Scare quotes emphasized, right? And so many tribes have been harvesting in areas where if the US or the state or the county or whoever it was found out they were doing that, they would be held accountable by the law. 
And so if I'm in a family, we've been doing that for several generations. We probably have a lot of knowledge about whether plants and animals and insects and so on are shifting. If I want to help a climate scientist learn more about that locality, I might say, oh, well, I know that there's been this or that trend. But I also probably have to disclose how I know that, which means I disclose where I got that information, which discloses where me and other people in the tribe are out harvesting. Um, and that then, if it goes public in a climate science study or as part of data that's accessible uh, to uh, people who might, might, not, might want more information on the study, or in cases where a privacy agreement was signed but the project is partly federally funded, it can be subject to a Freedom of Information Request Act because there are many people who would like to know where native people hunt, fish, trap, worship, whether it's to pillage the area, whether it's to get them in trouble, uh, for whatever reason. And so we had to work with climate scientists on, you have to understand treaty rights, you have to understand political jurisdictions. You have to understand the history of native land dispossession to understand actually how these risks would be generated in the first place. Very different from what they thought. And so with our guidelines approach, we've also developed workshops and other types of interventions. And actually a lot of US agencies now use these guidelines as their uh, central document. This is a short pamphlet. We have like a longer 100 page thing. So to close with just a few quick examples, um, you know, what, in my work, I really like to highlight for people, uh, and in this presentation, uh, it's harder to do as much of it as I usually like to do, but I think I have conveyed some of it, is that when we first talk about things like, well, how does knowledge exchange occur on a topic like climate change, you first have to respect it for indigenous people. You know, we've already been just super active in trying to come to terms with climate change and trying to figure out the best ways to respond just in our own efforts, right? And so oftentimes the best places to do that is within our own institutions, within our own context, right? It doesn't always have to take place within you know, a forum of, of science or at a university. And so one of the projects I've been part of um, is called Tribal Climate Camp, and it's for uh, staff members who work for tribes, you know, many of whom are native or members of those tribes. And they often have the issue that they're trying to develop a climate change program but they need to figure out how to integrate all the different types of knowledge within the tribe and then also work with climate science. So instead of something where you have somebody stand up and do what I do and talk about you know, how to do knowledge integration to an audience of, of native folks, we instead have a tribe host the event, have about six or seven tribes send you know, combinations of three or four staff members, including you know, could be community members, and then we invite a couple of climate scientists to come at different parts, but it's a primarily tribally owned event. Uh, and so, you know, we've done it at uh, Nez Perce um, and, you know, get to learn about what they're doing there and their traditions and how they've done things. The curriculum is actually developed with uh, elders. Um, and so they play a huge role in guiding what the curriculum is and just imparting a range of types of knowledge. And so this is again at, at Nez Perce the year we did it there, right? We have great food, local food, um, and learn about what the tribes are doing. This is at Nisqually where we hosted it one year. Learn how they're bringing together science um, and traditional knowledge to achieve their goals and outcomes. And so we, you, know, you can see there's not a lot of lecture. It's all based on practice and ceremony. Um, and so, you know, games things like that. And so it's, it's, you know, it's a different kind of education. So each tribal team then uh, gets to work with elders and uh, other specialists who come through the camp, right? And instead of you know, us telling them how to do stuff, they come up with their own plans for how they're gonna structure their climate change program. And it's all based on kind of a, an epistemological model that they start out with exactly how they're gonna think about climate change. And so this is kind of what the room looks like, right? Each of the teams is, is working and being creative and being artistic. Um, you know, and they come up with great plans moving forward that are grounded in their traditions. So they wanna see climate change according to, you know, to their traditions. They wanna draw and map out the ecosystems as it matters to them. Um, and then that becomes the basis of their climate change planning and how they wanna work with scientists. And so if, this is how tribes want to do things, right? And this is how tribes want to engage with climate uh, science. Then you can think about how strange it would be if a climate scientist would come and say, 
well, I just want um, some information from you and let's sign a contract to just make sure I'm not liable for any exploitation. Big difference, right? Complete change in what the collaboration is. So the climate science scientists that uh, come through this camp um, have different experience where they have to adapt to the presence of tribes, to the tribal approach, uh, different tribal approaches to, to dealing with climate change. And the different teams that have sort of, I guess, graduated from this so far, often their tribes doing excellent things. And in this camp, no topic is off the table. I mean, actually one of the biggest things that oftentimes get discussed is that because many tribes have adopted Western models of governance, they also have the gender and patriarchy problem now. And so oftentimes part of the camp is for women who are in tribal staff positions and are outnumbered by men, um, and in less powerful positions, how can they take leadership in a healthy way, in a healing way, in developing a, a tribal climate change program in that context? And so not something that many of our scientific collaborators were used to or comfortable talking about. Another um, camp that I'm part of, it's also sort of a week-long type of event, but for tribal college students, called the Indigenous Planning Summer Institute. It's essentially about climate change and environmental leadership for tribal college students. It's got about 30 uh, students that uh, come to this, and we've done it, you know, probably in different shapes and forms going back about four or five years, but the, the last couple of years we've done it in this particular way. And so the students um, come to understand what does it mean to take leadership in climate change? What does it mean to bring different ways of knowing together? They learn about that directly in the context of the Menominee tribe. And so the Menominee tribe, similar to the stories I've told you, they were also a seasonal round society. They're related to Anishinaabe people, but a different group. Um, and they literally saw a land base that covered almost all of Wisconsin, parts of Michigan, Illinois, reduced to that little box in the 19th century in a very short period of time. And their adaptation to it was to move from a seasonal society to a forestry tribe. And that's why you can see their reservation from outer space, because it's a green patch. And they took the lessons that their ancestors learned through seasonal, uh, uh, or through living a seasonal lifestyle, and applied that to the forestry industry. So early on, um, and they were considered kind of one of the first sustainable yield forests, but it's not a monocrop forest. And it's a forest that they designed to serve both economic needs, but also cultural, ceremonial, and family needs. And so when you go and see the forest, it's incredible, um, because it's not kind of a standard monocrop commercial forest. And the Menominee even developed their own model of sustainability, their own knowledge system for thinking about sustainability that arises from that experience of how to adapt so quickly. Um, and so the Menominee model can be used to analyze things in very complex ways using visual cues. And when we host students there, right, the, the star of the, the story is the forest, right? How did the living forest serve as a key way in which the Menominee re remained resilient in the face of massive anthropogenic climate changes, right? And they've got an amazing powwow ground there too, kind of built into the woods. And so a lot of what we do is outdoors. Um, it's discussion-based, no lecture. We visit the tribal enterprise and learn actually how it's not based on just pursuing sheer profit, but based on securing employment, and well-being in the tribe. Um, and we look at all the other stuff that's part of the culture as well, right? You know, uh, craft making and so on. What do all these activities, when you do them, what does that say about what it means to come to know uh, climate change? And then we go to some of the tribes next door, like the Oneida tribe, and look at what they've done to reinvent themselves. Is there a relocation tribe just like mine from the New York area to Wisconsin? And so we look at how they've transformed the landscape. This is their turtle school. They've cleaned up one of the most, some of the most polluted areas in Wisconsin um, and actually tried to build a presence for their tribe in their jurisdictional area and are experimenting with all sorts of new approaches to resilience and sustainability and climate change adaptation, but all with the idea that these technologies, and this one's actually intended to provide better nutrition for elders, right? It's all based on community accountability, the Food Sovereignty Project, and we invite native people from all over the world. This is Maria Elena Wambachano that works in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and works uh, in Peru with Quechua people as well. And so it's a whole thing, good food always. Um, but you know, it, again, it's the type of thing where what we're interested in doing is understanding within a tribal context, what does it mean to be in the position to deal with climate change, given our history, given what we've been through, and given actually our success stories. Um, 
And so this is much more about how we approach contemporary climate change um, than it is about some of these other questions that I hear a lot in other contexts about you know, how do humans, you know, come to terms for the first time with the Anthropocene, right? That humans are these major collective actors that we didn't know about before. That's important, I think, but we're also approaching it from a different perspective. And I think that's a key aspect when we're thinking about um, the ethics of knowledge exchange is that you're not going to have a successful experience. You're not really going to respect other people until you just have a sense to appreciate where they're coming from um, and that maybe they've already been engaged with a topic for a lot longer than you. Anyways, I appreciate you all coming. I look forward to uh, engaging further uh, in the question and answer period. Thank you. <laughs>
climate science, but other parts of the curriculum come out of what elders want people to know from their knowledge about climate change. So there's that notion of interdisciplinarity. There's another notion of interdisciplinarity, which is closer to what you're um, asking about, which is that for most tribal climate change programs, one part of it is the modeling and the historic trends for climate change in that locality. But in order to actually do that work, um, you actually have to know what the relevant jurisdiction is. And actually a lot of tribal jurisdictions are, you know, the best information is within those tribes. And they're very tricky jurisdictions because they're not just one big block like, you know, say the United States. And so you have to bring in law, policy, GIS, other types of techniques to be able to figure out, well, how do you best map climate change impacts onto the tribe? You also need social science as well because oftentimes the, uh, you have to understand how is it that people experience the climate change impacts? Do they experience them as an economic problem? If so, how? And you have to be pretty good at economics because in tribes you have formal and informal economies. You also have to understand, do people experience it culturally? And a lot of research is showing that actually some of the key issues of climate change, and I hinted a bit about this before, are psychological. And so how do you bring together psychology and like climate modeling <laughs> in a local tribal context? And so we're oftentimes having to figure out how to balance those things. And then finally, probably the part for me that's most interdisciplinary is that Historically, those governance systems that I was showing you before, those seasonal governance systems, they were very integrated. If somebody said, well, who's responsible for health or who's responsible for business in your society? It's like, what are you talking about? Um, but today, with most tribal governments in the US, but also on the Canada side too, um, we're now divided into these little departments. You know, health department, language department, natural resources department, business office, they're all separated. And the irony is, is that even though a lot of tribal government offices are pretty close together spatially, a lot of these folks don't talk to each other and they don't have an opportunity to talk to each other. And so we've had to create, um, so I've done direct climate change planning with almost 20 tribes and one of the key things we have to do is create these processes where you bring people from like the accounting office, the environmental office and language office together to talk about climate change. And so you have to attract them to it. So you have to figure out ways, well, for somebody who primarily does accounting, why is climate change a big enough issue for them that they'd show up at a meeting? <laughs> and so we try to create that kind of synergy because if you have a climate change plan that talks about economic issues, but you don't have the, you know, the business office involved, right? How good is that climate change plan, right? Or if you have a climate change plan that suggests some very tricky types of accounting, not very effective, if you have a climate change plan that doesn't involve language, why would somebody show up to a community meeting about climate science if they just think it's a bunch of abstract science? So that's kind of some of the ways that I understand it. But yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah. Yes. Um, did, were you involved with the Mystic Lake Declaration? I wasn't sure, I mean, moved by the quickly. And, and can you talk about, like, sort of similar to that question, like, so what went on in the crafting and the language of that, and how did it get written? And sort of, you know, when you're in one of these sort of contexts where a, a statement of first principles is being drafted, how did it go? And, and, and you know, what were the inputs that you were thinking about um, uh, drafting those kinds of things? Um, in that declaration, there's a place where they gender earth as female, um, and I'm curious, like, how did that statement get crafted and, you know, just sort of when you're getting to the place where the language matters and the principles are going out there, um, how does that get put into practice in your experience? Yeah. Yep, no, great question, and I mean, I know who you are, but what's your well, name? I'm Steve Rackman, in the English department. Okay, great, well, that's an awesome question. So. Yeah, when they did the Mystic Lake Declaration at Shakopee, uh, so over in Minnesota, uh, that was right, I think, when I was getting into it. And I didn't, um, so I hadn't attended that one, but I've been part of other declarations yeah. and documents. And so it's actually one of the, um, it's actually one of the, the critical issues that we face, and I'll kind of 
respond in, in this way, because I think this is what becomes um, interesting. It's kind of like the, the standard approach to doing declarations is like the sort of like the United Nations approach where somebody literally puts up like a Word doc or PowerPoint slides and then people in a room like this, sometimes with many more people, actually literally just, you know, somebody takes a shot and then you just get input and then you smooth it out, right? You know, but oftentimes those processes um, leave voices out or people feel silenced or people feel their power differentials that they don't want to upset. And so oftentimes you'll see that those might reflect the views of a few and uh, not of the larger group. And actually a lot of indigenous declaration writing, I'm not offended to you know, admit is, uh, you know, does occur in that way. And so the perspectives you see might be more favoring people who are part of the organization that funded the meeting. Um, so that's one aspect. But the, the more interesting, from my standpoint, discussion to have, which I think gets at what you're asking about, is to begin to use much more collaborative and uh, indigenous approaches for how to, uh, to co-write. You know, so whether it's things like, that are also Western approaches, like, you know, developing um, smaller work groups that then focus on areas and write certain sections and then integrate and then divide back up again and discuss and come up with review. You know, so kind of spreading out the, the labor but giving plenty of chance for people in a smaller group setting to be able to contribute. One of the things you see in the, the discourse, right, is that, so something like, like Mother Earth or the gendering of the Earth. So that is a particularly tricky to concept to understand because so not all tribes uh, gender the Earth in that way. However, um, for indigenous people, we operate in a very complex political sphere where there is at one level much more global and regional indigenous movements that appeal to certain audiences, right? So like certain genderings of Earth very much have a mainstream appeal. Um, but then there's also contexts where you want to be much more local. So for example, a lot of Anishinaabe understandings of, of Earth, right, um, don't really gender the Earth in that way. Yet one of the most traditional Anishinaabe uh, environmental and climate change movements is called in English the Mother Earth Water Walk. And so this becomes very complex in terms of what the signaling is. And so I've seen when I've been part of declaration, other type of writing, is it actually one of the key discussions you have over and over again until the very end is who's the audience? Because um, it's, you know, and with so many people that work locally and more globally, that you know, becomes a tricky question to ask because these events are very diverse in terms of walks of life and professions. <laughs> Thank you. Because yeah. just, I mean, it's a really, it's kind of a process. I'm just getting your perspective on how, uh, you know, when, you, when you're a participant. Uh, yeah. Yep. And I'll just add one thing to that because I know we're out of time, but um, uh, it's also important, I think, to, uh, and there's uh, 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 some students who probably can't yet, yet name officially um, that uh, I work with that they're, their goal is to actually understand. So we have these processes that come together, and oftentimes they are indigenous processes. Um, you get the statement, but if we analyzed how those networks worked, what would we find out? And one student, as an example that I'm working with, it's probably not ready to go um, public with the specific conclusions, but you know, we actually, uh, in the study um, of one particular network that kind of claimed to be pretty traditional, actually found some things that weren't so, uh, weren't so fantastic, like the fact that um, uh, women in the network were transferring a lot of knowledge, but men were making most of the decisions, <laughs> right? And so, you know, those are not good dynamics. And I think indigenous people uh, are beginning to get more comfortable with the idea of this reflexivity and even using things like quantitative social network analysis to serve those purposes. Yeah, thanks for your question. I think we should thank Dr. White. <laughs>